Our second naturalistic hypothesis is that the apostle stole the body. Now, it's important to keep in mind that this is not a commonly believed or pushed academic explanation for the resurrection itself. It pops up primarily in popular circles, but you do see the scholar Richard Carrier uh, writing an article on this in the book, The Empty Tomb. And here's essentially what he says uh, to use the apostle stealing the body as a plausible explanation. He says, so even if the empty tomb story is not a legend, it is not necessary to conclude that a, uh, uh, that a genuine resurrection would explain it. One prominent natural explanation is the theft of the body. Another, which I developed in a pre preceding chapter, is that the body was legally moved without knowledge of the disciples. But the present essay demonstrates the plausibility, but by no means the certainty of the hypothesis that the body was stolen. Now, a couple things are of interest from this quote. Number one, you have a scholar like Richard Carrier, who's trained in this area and written in this area, pushing forward the hypothesis that the apostles stole the body. Thus, we need to take it seriously. But pay close attention to his methodology. He's not saying this is certain. He's not even saying this best explains the evidence. He's simply saying it's a possible explanation. Now, why would he say that? Because he's assuming naturalism. If you start with the idea that God doesn't exist and there must be a natural explanation, it doesn't matter if this hypothesis can't explain all the facts. By definition, because it's naturalistic, it necessarily must be a better explanation. So realize his thinking behind this as he even raises this objection. Now there's a number of problems with this. Let's unpack a few of them just one by one. One of the problems is the guards would have protected the body. If the guards were really placed there as Matthew reports, now I do realize that it's only the Gospel of Matthew that includes the guards. So historically and apologetically speaking, it's not multiply attested. We're on less ground with the historical confidence of the guard than we are, say, the death of Jesus or the empty tomb. But it's still a piece that's reported early. And by the way, the Gospel of Peter, which is a late second century, more kind of apocryphal or Gnostic account, that's not really written by or based on the testimony of Peter, but it's in the end of the second century, actually reports that a guard was there as well. So it could be a second independent testimony to the existence of the guard. Now, the charge about the guard protecting the body, this would only make sense if it was widely known that the tomb, in fact, was empty and the guard was actually placed there. Why would this story be included in Matthew's account if there wasn't a wider knowledge that not only was the tomb empty, but that the guard was placed there. Now, one of the questions, we don't want to spend too much time on this, but it is important, is people ask, was the guard a Jewish temple guard or is it a Roman guard? I tend to believe that it was a Roman guard, and there's a few reasons for this. Number one, two chapters earlier, Matthew 26, Roman soldiers were assigned to temple authorities for security. So we see them already involved to a degree. The Gospel of Peter understands the guard as Roman. And Craig Keener, who's written on this extensively, he says a Roman guard, having a Roman guard, would leave them less open to the charge of tampering with the evidence. So it would make far more sense and be so much more wise to have a Roman guard placed there. And by the way, if the guards were Jewish, why would they be responsible for, to the Roman governor for failing duty? That doesn't seem to make sense. Now, think about this as well. The guard story is actually incomplete. If this was a story invented later, then it fails. Why? Because they don't add the guard story until long after the burial took place. If they're trying to show there's no way that they stole the body, they would have had to place the guard there right when they seal the body and bury it. But they don't, which tells us, at least in Matthew's account, he's not inventing this to cover up for that hypothesis. Rather, he's reporting what actually happened. Bottom line, it doesn't really matter if it was a temple guard or a Jewish guard in terms of them protecting the body. There's no way a group of fishermen and the apostles could have gotten by it. 
Now again, I recognize that the guard story is only in Matthew, so it has limited apologetic value. But when it comes to claims the apostle stole the body, it's a piece of the reason that this explanation falls short. A larger question that we'll get to later on in this class has to do with this question. Why would the apostles willingly suffer and die for the claim that Jesus rose from the grave and is Lord of the universe if they stole the body because then they would know that it's false? Friends, the idea of the apostles stealing the body lacks a motivation for the apostles, at least a known one. We have to invent a motivation because it seems to betray everything they believed and in many cases even expected about the Messiah itself. So I invent the story that Jesus resurrected, go take the body and proclaim it to the world in a way they get threatened, beaten, and some of them die if it weren't true. Third, why would the disciples unwrap the body? If they steal the body, why would the Gospels report that the garments were left behind? That doesn't seem to make sense. Fourth, the apostles weren't expecting a resurrection. So what accounts for their belief in resurrection? Now, Jesus had predicted this. He had told them, we see in Mark 8, Mark 9, and Mark 10, a prediction, but clearly the story is saying they didn't understand it. They didn't expect this. In fact, Jews expected a corporate resurrection at the end of time. So even if the account they stole the body has any merit, what's lacking is what accounted for their belief in the first place that Jesus had resurrected. In other words, why would they come up with this idea that this crucified Messiah had risen on the third day and had conquered life? What is the source of the motivation for this idea? And of course, the apostle stealing the body doesn't account for it. This is a popular hypothesis. On its surface, it seems to make a little bit of sense. When we probe more deeply, we realize they couldn't get by the guards. They had no motivation to do this, at least no really good common sense motivation. And uh, there's still no account for the origin of the Christian faith. There's no good reason to believe the apostles stole the body.